Let's go back to our story on the ANC chief's whip's call for the resignation of the entire party's senior leadership. Ibrahim Fakir from the Electoral Institute for the Sustainability of Democracy in Africa has joined us now. He's the manager for governance, institutions and processes at the organization. And some very interesting developments regarding Jackson and Tembu in the last few days. Was his call for the, the NEC leaders to resign brave or foolish? Ibrahim, what would you say? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, the question is why now? Uh, and why after a series of massive mishaps, of huge blunders in ethical governance, in massive corruption scandals. You can think about a private family landing the airplane at an uh, aircraft base, breaching security, breaching our sovereignty in effect. A head of state benefiting to the extent of 250 million rand. Forget all of the questions around compliance, forget all of the questions around what the president is entitled to. A basic ethical question around whether any individual is entitled and eligible to receive benefit to that extent, number two. Number three, the replacement of a finance minister, the wiping off of huge amounts of money of our pension funds. So huge amounts of scandals, massive public outcry, and yet the entire NEC quite apart from defending the president and the ANC in parliament, now decided that it's time to wake up. Why now? And it seems to me quite curious that this is simply about, and if you listen carefully to Jackson and Timbo, it's about the loss of power. So it's not about effective public management. It is not about good administration. It is not about compliance-led governance. It is not even about economic growth and job creation, because those appear to be the last things on their mind. It is not even about compliance-led governance. This is merely about the ANC at the risk of losing power. It's an interesting thing you say, because looking at Mtembu's track record, I mean, it just in recent days, he's managed to persuade Baleka Mbeta against her will to hold on to the public protector's report, although she initially refused. He's gone up against communications minister Faith Mutambi over digital encryption. Some people would say that there are a couple of instances where he's really stood up for what he believed in, and, and he has swum against, against the, the stream. Well, okay, without being churlish, I suppose it is quite brave. Uh, it's not entirely foolish depending on how you think this is going to, going to actually crumble, uh, how the cookie is going to crumble after this. But so it is, it is quite brave, it is not entirely foolish, and it is taking certain principled decisions. But I think what in effect is telling us, if I think about the litany of maladministration, sometimes even blatant corruption, actual manipulation of public institutions, that perhaps they were able to be silent all the time simply because the tide was not in their favor. Mm -hmm. Now it appears that the tide may be changing, that there's a little bravery emerging, not just amongst the beachhead of the ANC's political representative in parliament, which is their chief whip, but also among sitting ministers in cabinet who are prepared to say they can't countenance the prosecution of Provin Gordon. But of course, there's a curious series of logic at play here. Remember back in 2005, 2006, the very people who are now saying that the rule of law must prevail and Praveen Gordon should face these charges, were saying at that time that malicious prosecution can't in fact be a prosecution. So their logic is completely flawed. And I think for Jackson and Timbo and a whole series of people in the ANC who are now standing up, certainly is brave. But the question still remains, where were your voices during all of the other scandals, some of them fairly monumental? Is this really about good governance? Is this really about good administration and effective public management and compliance-led governance? Or is this merely about protecting the ANC's hegemony in political terms? Because I think it's becoming increasingly clear that if the ANC behaves in this way, not only are we left with only two options to think about it, that either it is inept and it doesn't know what it's doing because there's a whole series of appointments which haven't quite panned out, some which have been deemed by the courts to be irrational even, a massive loss of support, no economic growth, high unemployment. So clearly all of this appears to either suggest that either they don't know what they're doing or on the other hand they are doing things maliciously, uh, they are manipulating public institutions and there's lots of evidence to that and the worst case scenario is that there's a combination of, of the two. That there is a manipulation of public institutions, selective prosecution for private gain, 
manipulation of institutions also for private gain, and an inability not to be able to manage the affairs of the Republic in an effective way. That's the worst case scenario for citizens. Has Mtembu spoken out of turn by, by not following ANC processes, or have he and a number of others who seemingly belong to that camp now and who've started speaking out realized dissenting voices are, are simply not going to be heard within the party? Well, I think it's a seductive argument, and it's easy to lapse into that sort of process, procedural fence, and hide behind it and say, well, you should follow the internal processes. Well, look where internal processes got the country to and where it got the ANC to. In fact, it got the ANC a massive hammering in the local government elections. Equally, there's also a seductive argument that this is about the realignment. Uh, and transformation of the economy. It's about the anti-colonial project. It's about decolonizing the economy. It's about breaking the back of white monopoly capital. Well, literally then, where's the evidence? Where's the jobs? Where's the new economic players? Where's the new industrialists? None of this is evident. So why should we believe that this is part of that project? Now, I think if you put the two together, what you have is a set of people who basically reached the point which said, enough is enough. That should be lauded, that should be applauded, but I think we ought, as a public, ought to keep our eye on the prize that actually, we need to force these people into defending a record of clean and good public governance and effective compliance-led governance, but also one which ensures that we can actually attract investment, grow the economy and create jobs, because those appear to be the fundamental things which will restore confidence in public government. I, I'm wondering what it means for the ANC having a chief whip in parliament who appears to now be opposed to some, to some of the fundamental I individuals and workings of the party. Well, the idea that the ANC can now turn around and say that we are not divided is foolhardy. Uh, I think the evidence is clear for everyone to see. Of course, the machinations at play inside the ANC, and it does for those who want to think that this is a titanic battle between good and evil, that the good guys appear to be preponderant at the moment, as therefore they feel emboldened to speak out. But certainly, this doesn't bode well for the way in which they can cohesively go forward in crafting a governance agenda or a public administration and management agenda. But there is a curious thing here also that we don't speak enough about. And that is the fact that, look, there are going to be motions of no confidence and two already have been put on the table. Those who believe that they want to put their money where their mouths are must now stand up and be seen to be counted if they be, irrespective that they will, these will be moved by and the agency will be moved by the opposition parties firstly. Secondly, not only are they the instruments of the state, they are also the instruments of the party itself, of the ANC itself, disciplinary committees, the integrity committee. Yet none of these appear to be used. And so people make public statements without using the instruments available to them in order to prosecute or to push their political agenda. Now, doesn't that suggest the instruments themselves are flawed or unusable at this point? On the contrary, if we think about all of the complaints made, particularly by opposition parties, about the fact that the system is broken and it doesn't work, they've proved on the contrary that the system does. Whether it's curtailing the power of the speaker to use her, her, her power arbitrarily, whether it's the power of the executive and the president in particular to make the kind of decisions they simply want to, the courts have proven and the oversight mechanisms all through the system have proven that they actually work. No one's actually tested these mechanisms in the ANC. The problem is in the ANC is that it appears as if they, these mechanisms work when they sort of work to the advantage of a popular or the hegemonic force at that particular time. If they don't suit their political interests, they won't be used. But if you think about President Zuma and the way in which he uses even the public protectors reports, Becky Taylor's case, the case of Panzit Lakula at the IEC, when the late Sitkelo's Cheka had to be um, had to be dealt with, then the president was very happy to rely on public protectors reports. But but you know when it's not convenient then he doesn't. And that's the logic which pervades the ANC. It's a it's a selective compliance, it's a it's a culture of compliance in using the instruments only when they are convenient. And so it is this culture of convenience which will undermine long-term compliance behavior of all citizens, but also promote greater degrees of impunity in the way in which behave as, as the public. Always good talking to you, Ibrahim Fakir. Thank you so much for coming in. He is from the Electoral Institute for the Sustainability of Democracy in Africa.